This morning we have two scripture passages, and the first one is from Ecclesiastes 12, and we'll be reading the verses 1 through 8. And the second one is from 2 Corinthians 5, reading the verses 1 through 10. Ecclesiastes 12, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark, and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors of the street are closed and the sound of the grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of the birds, but all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, and when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred. Then man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the great spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. And then from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading the verses 1 through 10. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, therefore guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, and we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, and I say we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body whether good or bad. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, in this present pandemic situation, if we have a job, we're quite happy. And if the prospect is there that we may lose our job, we worry about it. And so to speak about retirement in the present situation seems a bit far-fetched. Our problem, our situation, our need is to know that for the immediate future, our economic situation, our work situation is, insec is secure. But think of uh, back to normal times. And then we look forward to retirement if we are working, and somehow the idea of 65 enters into our collective mind, and we know that when we turn 65, then we are entitled to retire. But do you know where this number 65 came from? It's rather interesting. Apparently there was, about 150 years ago, there was a leader in one of the European countries, and he was in trouble. He was facing an election, and the opposition was hinting at a pension plan for the workers. 
because these workers had worked hard all their lives and physically they were just done. They couldn't keep going and so they were losing their jobs without any income. And so the political leader says, look, if I'm facing an election, then I better come up with a plan for retirement. And so he said to his finance minister, I want you to come up with a plan that will not bankrupt the government. So the finance minister took out his pencil, did some figuring, calculating, and he said to his leader, 65 is the age of retirement. And the leader says, why did you come to 65? He says, well, when I look about, people never reach 65, and many men shortly die after 65. So 65 is that magical age, and it will not bankrupt the government. Well, other European countries took over that 65 and the notion that at 65, the government would provide a pension. And that notion then also came to America, and so the United States and Canada adopted 65 as the age of retirement. The thing is, we live much longer than simply if to 65. As a matter of fact, someone has said, you know, we live kind of in three stages. The first stage is growing up, settled. The next stage is being productive in terms of raising a family, doing our work. And the last stage, the last third of our is in retirement. So retirement and old age is not just a few years that have been to our life, but it is part and parcel of our living in our society, in our day and age. But how do we look at aging? Well, there are two predominant vision and views of aging in our society. And the first one is that it is a problem that we can overcome. If we throw enough resources at it, if we do this, do that, if we do all these kinds of things, take these kinds of physical education classes and these kinds of um, tests and these kinds of things, then aging and growing older is simply a problem that we can overcome. Because after all, and we hear that from scientists, our bodies could conceivably live till 120. And many medical scientists are saying, what can we do to allow people to live till 100? So there is a sense of more is better. And aging is a time of just endless possibilities. There's another view, and that is that aging is a time of losses. You lose your work, and for men that is a great troublesome time, isn't it? All your life you've been productive, and all of a sudden you no longer have your work to go to. That's a loss. And as we get older, we lose our spouses. Grandparents die, as we again heard in the congregational prayer. And so as we age, we face one after another. And for some, that is very prevalent. And so there are many seniors, many older people who become depressed. Because really what they're saying is this, all there is to our life. I can't do the things I want. My health is failing. Is that all there is? I would suggest there is another way of looking at aging. And that, that life is a journey. From the beginning to the end. Oh, there are some people who are perhaps a little closer to the end point than young people. But I am convinced that we need to look at aging and growing older, not of old people. But that way we age from the beginning of our birth to the last breath that we breathe. And I would suggest this morning that when we look at aging, really we look at simply ourselves. Let me suggest this. Who are you? Young people and boys and girls, you're 
probably just itching to go back to school again. Oh, not for your homework and not for these kinds of assignments, but you want to be with your friends. And you hate being cooped up. And you say, what's going on? Older people, many are fearful of the virus and don't dare to go out. By the way, just as an aside, if you are fearful, whether you are young or old, what I've learned in my chaplaincy ministry is to tell people, turn off the TV. You can be traumatized by that trauma. And so sometimes you need to turn off your TV and the bad news that you hear. Because otherwise you become even more fearful. But at any rate, the question of who are we? For young uh, children, boys and girls, teenagers, as, as you're beginning to think about plans and maybe you're graduating this year and you're wondering, what is college or university going to be like? So all kinds of questions you have about the present. Who am I in this situation? And parents, as you're trying to teach your children and as you have them home, you're wondering, you know, how, how can I do this? I'm not a teacher. And you probably get frustrated. Again, who am I in this situation? And as we get no longer are gainfully employed, we sometimes wonder, do I still have a purpose? Do I still have a meaning? And what is my life all about? Because you see, there's a lot of ageism in our society that when you're old, you're no longer good. Oh, you're good for the stores and they'll give you a 10% discount on Tuesday morning if you come in early. But that's an economic view of aging. But I know as older people, many of you have questions about what is the purpose of my life? Who am I? What can I do my, when my health is failing and my energy is limited? So you see, aging is not simply about being old. Aging is a lifelong journey as we go through the various stages of life. I entitled the message, Growing Older Gracefully. I really could have said, Grow Living Gracefully at various stages. So that's one thing. Who am I? And connected with that, what is my purpose? Why am I here in this world? Oh, and I know young people, you're asking those kinds of questions too. Why am I here? What, what is my life all about? Oh, I know you're busy with life and you want to get your driver's license. And if you, could, if you have your driver's license, you want to get a car or a truck so you can boom around. And if you're closer to graduating, you wonder what kind of a job will you get? Will you find a life partner? Will you have children? All those things are energizing and all those things are wonderful. <coughs> but let's look at the preacher for a moment. He says, you know, there's really nothing new under the sun. What has been will be. And he's been called a spoiled sport. He's been called a pessimist. Because is that all there is to life? Grab what you can while we're young. Kind of deal with it when we're middle-aged. And when we get old, we just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's it, folks. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless as the preacher. And the preacher had looked at life and he says, you know, from one point of view, that is true. But you see, the Bible refuses to accept that view of life. The Bible refuses to accept that we are simply living here, spending some time and energy, and then dying. As a matter of fact, Paul holds before us, says, you know, yes, we groan in this life, and when we have these losses, that's terrible, and that's frustrating, and when we're not sure whether we have enough of a paycheck to put food on the table, that is troublesome. But Paul says, you know, we are on a journey to a great and wonderful future. 
He says this tent, this body is simply a tent, but what we are going to get from God is a heavenly dwelling. What we are going to get from God is a new body in a new creation. Six feet under is not the end. This life is but the beginning. And again, young people and middle-aged people don't think that is just something that older people think about. Or maybe they think about it because they're a little closer. I would challenge you this morning to live before the face of God, knowing your future, whether you are 5, 15, 55, or 85. Because it's not, this is my life, and then at the end, well, oh yeah, now I've got to get some things in order, and then I can die. That's not true. Who am I? What is my purpose? God gives each and every one of us a purpose in life. I'm glad in our denomination we are going to be speaking more and more about intergenerational church. We need each other. Oh, we have different forms and styles of music and music appreciation, sometimes even different styles of worship. But when we are in an intergenerational church, we don't say, well, this is the way I want it, never mind about someone else. Is we come together as the people of God, as the body of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to live gracefully and to go through the various stages with its joys and its troubles, etc. But there's another thing that we have in common, young people with older people, and older people in common with young people. And that's asking the tough questions. It is interesting that in studies that show why young people and young adults leave the church and sometimes leave the faith, it's been shown that one of the reasons that young people leave the church were never allowed to ask the tough questions, the different questions. Like, where is God? And who is God? Why do we say that Christianity is the only good answer and the only true religion? These are the questions, folks, older people, that young people are asking. And don't shut them. Allow them exploration, because I dare say, and I'll speak to the older people, some of you are asking the same kind of questions. Maybe you don't dare to speak about that. But I've worked with seniors and older people long enough. Those are the same kinds of questions. So young people, grandpa and grandma, are no different from you. They worry about the future, they worry about you, but they also ask the tough questions. And some of them even worry whether God loves them. Growing older gracefully is accepting the grace of God that comes to each and every one of us at whatever stage of life we are. And we are a different stage. Out about that. But let's be honest with each other. And when these tough questions come, and I would encourage you also in this time and in this situation of the pandemic, older folks, have you talked to your children about what medical assistance is you need? What will happen if you land up in the hospital? Have you got a will? All these kinds of things, and I know, and I mention that because I know you are afraid to speak to your children. And those who are caring for older people, do you ever ask your parents? Do you have an open and honest conversation about the hope that is within us so that we can truly begin with the confession, my comfort in life and in death, both with body and soul is that I belong to my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm willing to talk about the tough things, about funeral planning, about the future. For you see, those are gifts that we can give to each other. I know the conversations are difficult, the conversations are not comfortable. 
But if we are to experience the grace of God, we're not limited, as we heard this morning in the children's message, to the sanctuary. As a matter of fact, maybe one of the blessings is that we're thinking about church and worship in a much bigger picture. That's what it means to live gracefully. Whatever place we have and at whatever stage in life we are. So I trust that you will have conversations. And young people, I hope that you begin to see, just in a little bit, we could talk so much more about it, but you begin to see you are no different than grandpa and grandma. The questions you have, the concerns you have, they have. Oh, maybe they don't always want to talk about it. And sometimes they say, well, you know, wait till you grow up and then you'll understand. And older folks, don't shut young people out. And you are in the middle caring for your kids and your parents. Be open with your kids and your parents. Talk about how grace, God, God's grace comes to us in every stage of life, whether we are raising children, whether we are empty nesters, whether we are gainfully employed, or we now are retired and using our gifts in a different way. The beauty is that God has given us this life, this life to live. Oh, it comes with pain, and the preacher was honest, and it sometimes is frail, and that's what Paul mentions. But the glorious future is this, that one day we will live in a restored creation. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we ourselves will, too, be restored. And so I challenge you this morning. Have faith. Whether you're 5, 15, 55, or 85. And please, have conversations with your children and your parents. Amen.